I assume most of you have driven cabs, right? If you're uh, how many people in this room are studying journalism? And how many of you have driven cabs for how long? Say over a year, enough to be meaningful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, novelists now, don't have to. Now you want they can go to bars. <laughs> are you ready to start, or am I supposed to keep going? No, we'll, 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 we'll just go here. I'll okay, agitate okay, you. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not kidding about the, uh, the cab. Um, I used to write fiction for less than minimum wage once in a while, and I've been published under a number of names, and I, I'm not particularly proud of what I've done. I've gotten a lot better since. You guys are all young and smart, and I'm old and not very smart, so it took me a long time to learn to write well. Someday I will get it whipped. Still working on it. Um, the taxi cab really and truly did force me to do reporting because one day I had nothing to do and I wrote a little piece and I sent it to the Baltimore Evening Sun and my neighbor Michael picks up the paper the next day after next and he said, oh, they um, ran your story that you sent. I said, oh, that's cool. And uh, three days later, a $100 check showed up and this was a piece that had taken me 45 minutes to write and I realized that this, this, this newspaper stuff was a gravy trade, that it was like free money. It would have taken me, you know, in a cab, I was making maybe $15 an hour. So if I can get $100 an hour for sitting there on my butt typing at home, it, it, even though it's more boring than driving a cab, which is more fun, I will do it. And a couple weeks later, a cab I was driving broke on a Friday night, which is the best night of the week. So I went home. And I wrote 4,000 words about the taxi cab business itself. And I sent a copy of that to Baltimore Magazine. You have a city magazine here. Every city has one. They're all the same, really. The Fluff Mag. And um, sent one to the uh, Baltimore City Paper, which is a you know, weekly alternative paper. You have one of those here, too. And the guy who was editing Baltimore Magazine three weeks later calls me back and says, you know, that story you sent me, I found your phone number through a mutual friend. I lost it. It was, it was real good. But at the same time, like within an hour, Michael, the guy who edited Baltimore City Paper, said, you know, it's a really great story. We'd like it as our cover next week. I'll give you $500 for it. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. There's, <laughs> I like this. The story ran. I got a great deal of hate mail um, because <laughs> I wrote very honestly from the cab driver's left front seat. And then uh, Mike Bowler, who was one of the last of the Mencken trained editors at the uh, Baltimore Evening Sun, wanted me to write more stuff for him. So I wrote about cab passengers. His pitch to get me to do it was William Raspberry, the columnist, often talks, he talks to cab drivers, interviews them, and does stories. He says, why don't you just skip the step, and skip Raspberry and do it direct. I'll give you 150 bucks a column. Now remember, it's taking me under an hour per column. So I already knew how to type. Typing is pretty easy. It's a skill you can acquire. And I don't know about you. I type around not real fast. I type about 55 words a minute. And at that time, we were just starting to get these automatic word processor things so you could back up and correct your mistakes without whiteout. And um, so that got it down to half hour. Per so I'm sitting here saying, this is so cool. I'm making as much as a lawyer. <laughs> OK, and I still drive the cab because that's fun. And, and, you know, it was the material, you know, because that's the next thing I learned is um, all of this journalism stuff isn't about writing. And that was, had been my mistake earlier in life was figuring that fiction and making stuff up and cute writing was where it's at. Where it's really at is getting information and research and putting it together and synthesizing it in a new and interesting way. That, that, that research is everything. And I started haunting more and more the Pratt Library. We didn't have this internet stuff at the time. So I spent a lot of time in libraries. I learned junk that wasn't immediately apparent. I just started, I'd always been a learner, a reader, a library user, but I started going more toward history and backgrounding. I found just hanging around and wandering the old equitable, it's pronounced equitable to you, but locally there in the Balmer dialect, equitable assurance society's collection of city directories going back to 1794. 
And I noticed that there were a lot of tea rooms listed in the Fells Point District, which had been the original, the original harbor and maritime district. I wondered why they would have tea rooms for roughneck sailors. And finally, finally I talked to a guy who's a historian. We are drinking a beer or two, and he says, oh, that's what they used to call the whorehouses. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now it makes sense, you know, tea rooms for refined young ladies. And in an area which had a lot of, you know, semi-bars, and I'd written about some of the colorful characters male and female met there, and a woman who had several apartments and young ladies hung out in some bars, and I made good money in a cab from them, and they told me great stories. But now we had the glimpse of, and I went back and I found that this had been going on, not just for 10 years or for five years, but at least since the 1790s, and probably before that, because the, 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 that was the first city directory was 1794. Okay. And now I could become an expert on this, and I kept going around and finding more things, just useless bits of junk knowledge, how telemarketers work and why some people do well at it and some don't, um, what kind of drug use at diff different drug uses at different campuses, college campuses in the Baltimore area. We found, and I, I always had friends helping me here, that, that different campuses used, had different drug problems. Hopkins, actually, which had the highest um, SAT scores and average IQ among students, interestingly enough, had the highest hallucinogen use. Um, but another school I will, let's not name them, they had a high crack use, but it was a very easy school to get into. <laughs> so you start making a graph like this, and you start looking at that. You go around, you take, I would see a lot of people have tape recorders. I just use a little micro cassette myself. And you go around, and you start talking to people about that. And my God, you have a story. And if you talk to enough people, you get some cool quotes. The old lady psychiatrist at the Student Health Service at Hopkins who said, well, we don't really have any drug problems. We just have bright students who like to experiment. And once in a while, some of them get too enthusiastic. And I ran that. And she got absolutely cranked by the administration, and she retired. She was ready to retire, and she was tired of a lot of their blathers. She said she hated the administration. She thanked me and came over for supper. <laughs> <laughs> so you meet a lot of neat people, you know. And also in the same story, the um, police chief in Montgomery County, Maryland, who said, Oh, we don't have any drug problems. People want to, you know, do something, get stoned at home, and don't shoot each other on the corners. We got better things to worry about. <laughs> and that's how it went. I just started randomly going around, listening to people, driving the cab. They talk to you like a bartender with privacy. And then I didn't need the cab anymore. And I did get the limousine and did very well with it. And uh, did not go to work as a reporter because staff reporters didn't get any money, and this I was having more fun. Now I'm going to tell you the real secret about making money in journalism. Well, we can see some of these people writing this one down. <laughs> yeah. Without going into public relations. But the real secret is find some sort of technical area that nobody knows about and translate their, their text speak into English. If you can do that, all of a sudden you have a specialty skill. And I learned this by accident, hanging around Johns Hopkins, because it was real close, that I could take developments from their electronics and engineering people in the field of medicine, and I could write about them for the lay audience, in that case doctors that I could go to their material science labs. And just by reading their press releases very carefully and looking through them, I could say, hmm, this seems interesting. And I can go to the um, material science department. And I can get an article I could sell to Machine Design Magazine, a, a, a magazine for industrial engineers, design engineers. I discovered the technical and trade press. And I found that they paid me more money with less hassle than the public, you know, media. And technical journalists tend to be looked down upon, and there's no awards you've seen. Nobody gets a Pulitzer for that. Nobody, ever. But you get 
75 cents a word reliably, on time, with no hassle. This is good. The problem is you have to know things like math. Because when people speak math at you, you have to be able to translate it into terms that a less sophisticated audience can understand. And now here's a real secret. If you become a really good translator, you can take the ultra tech guy who does speak in engineering speak or computer geek speak, and you can turn it into several levels of English. And I don't know if anybody's told you yet the uh, dictum about freelancing that how to make money is to sell it three times. Have you heard that yet? Okay, you're hearing it now. Sell it three times. That's the rule. That's how you make a living, how you make good money. And you make one that's for the high-tech magazine. This still has math. You can use algebraic and calculus symbols in that story. People will understand it. The second one you do is for the regional localish publication because it's a cool local guy doing something. This one had better not have any much science or engineering in it. You have to explain why this guy's anti-corrosion stuff is helping to preserve the cool statues. All right? And that way it's... I'm sure you have a television station here that does use, news, use, you can news, news you can use. That's a big TV slogan that comes and goes. But, you know, it's something that people can say, yep, those statues, I read about that. See, because then it becomes cool bit of knowledge they can share. And then you get to do a third one, because we brought the statues in. Now you go to one of the museum publications, and you do a separate technical article about using this particular anti-corrosion technology as a restoration te for, uh, technique for metal statues. We have three articles based on one set of interviews, two so-so photographs, and we just got what, $800, $1,000, and it's Tuesday. And we have the rest of the week to go drive a cab, go out swimming, you know, do whatever we want. And this is why I got into journalism. You may have other reasons. Yeah, I do. <laughs> well, first, f I'll start with um, a new thing. And um, I'm, I, could you please, if you're going to listen to this, please come in and close the door just for the next couple of seconds, because I am going to reveal a secret we don't want getting out to the world at large. I didn't bring my non-disclosure agreement, so we'll just use a psychic one, and you're all under NDA. I have a new <laughs> method of making money on the internet, and it is a secret. And please do not share it with people from other planets, anyway. The secret of making money on the internet is to take in more than you spend. <laughs> yes, I know it's a new concept. It is radical. It is a departure from formulas used by <clears throat> many internet entrepreneurs locally and elsewhere. But it does work. Now I'm going to give you a second homily. I'm going to sound like the grandson of a Jewish jewelry star or store owner in Flint, Michigan, I, in the Depression, really. I wonder why that might be. Um, the second one is start small and grow. Don't try to be real big at first. People who have shown that this works, oh wait, it doesn't just work on the internet. Um, there was this guy, Sam, used to have a store or two in, what was it, Fort Benton, Arkansas? Wasn't that it? Ben, ben, I knew it was something like that. I don't hang out in Arkansas much. And then he got another store, another store. He didn't open 400 stores in one week. Am I right or am I right? And the first time I saw one of the, the Walmart stores was a long time ago. I was in the Army. I was at Fort Hood, Texas, and it wasn't that big. It wasn't near as big as the ones now. But he started with one little store, and he got two. He got four, and then he got some medium-sized stores. And now they have a a, a monument, I swear to you, I swear I may not be making this up, that someplace <laughs> in Montana, there is a place that there's a national monument and a little historical thing on the road says, this is the only spot within the United States, continental United States, where there is no Walmart within 10 miles. But you see, it started small and grew. 
this is the same thing whether you're doing news on the internet or you're doing anything else on the internet or, God forbid, out in meat space, the real, otherwise known as the real world. Um, it's better to start small and screw up. Are you perfect? Yeah, you. Yes. He's perfect. <laughs> screw him. Are you perfect? Now, see, he's old enough. He knows he's not perfect. <laughs> okay, so have you made a mistake? Yeah, lots. Have you made a mistake? Yeah. Have you made a mistake? Absolutely. Have you made a mistake? Is it smarter to make a mistake really big and screw up a lot of money or to make it real small and learn cheap? Really small. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, the last three or four or five years, we have seen living proof that many people have not learned this sort of stuff. Now, you and your friends <laughs> spent billions. Now, we know some of that was laundered drug money through those VCs probably, but that's okay. But a lot of it was money taken by ordinary citizens that they tossed into these dream venture companies. Salon was one of them. When I worked for is another one, one of the most famous ones. But I just work for one little division that knows how to do its stuff. We'll get to that in a moment. But what happened with all these people? Well, first of all, these investors, they didn't do any worse than they would have done if they'd put that money in the lottery tickets. So they're popular. Does North Carolina have a state lottery? Uh, that would be wrong. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it would be wrong. Okay, well, yeah. Okay. Well, let's thank God. In Maryland, there used to be a healthy underground numbers industry. And before the state, you know, before they communized gambling, you know, it used to be private industry. You know, we had nice, happy mafiosos and such. Anyway, lottery tickets, perhaps not in North Carolina, but in many states are quite the thing. And the states do advertise it. You've got to play to win. And that standard grammatical inaccuracy done in rock and roll, you've got to play to win. I hate it, but that's the tagline used in many of the spots. So the stock market was no worse than that. And unlike the Enrons, what happened with a lot of these companies, of course, was the development and the sponsorship of much of the lovely free and open source software that people like me use today. So there was some good created out of it, just as there was a lot of track laid by early railroads that went broke. You guys know that most of the early railroads went, went bust, right? Did you know that? Yeah, it was, what was the survival rate? Does anybody remember offhand as a percentage? What was it, around 10, 12 percent? Yeah. Most people who tried to make railroad companies back when the steam engine stuff was the big news went broke. Remember that when they were, well, they didn't call it the Internet. Call it the train, train space. They probably, no, not train space, telephone space. Then why do people talk about Internet space? Wait a minute. It, it, internet, wait, 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 wait a minute. This Internet thing, isn't that like where you have the telephone and you just send data through the wires and the fiber optic? I, I don't think that's anything new all of a sudden. I'm, I'm just thinking. It, it doesn't sound like a business to me, except unless you're providing the infrastructure, in which case you're in the same position as the guys who made the metal to make them railroad tracks. It sounds to me all of a sudden like the Internet is not a business or a place. It's just like a, a, a tool for businesses. Anybody here ever written anything that was published in a paper publication? On paper? Well, me too. Anybody? Well, yeah, well, there's people in this room who are ashamed of it, but we know we, we don't care who you are. <laughs> The reality is, all the internet is to me is, a, is, you know, it's like, you know, you have this room, you know, in a newspaper or such. You open it and it gets real loud because that's where the printing presses are. They used to have linotype machines. If you are a student here, you are not old enough to have seen a linotype machine. I am. And to have, as a child, found them admirable and large, clanking hot things. And... Anyway, open this door, and there's the press room. Printing presses are really big, right? And they're impressive, and they're cool. Then you've got all the paper and the web, and you have the trucks that take it out, and the carriers. You drop the newspaper in the box and take them on people's lawns and drop them at the stores and all that. Now, to me, I've got a server room 
with network admins and some little fiber optic cable. And these network admins may have these racks of computers. Hey, yo, what's the difference? On my side of the door, we're still collecting information, trying to spell most of it right most of the time, and, you know, get the names right anyway. And on the other side, that information goes out to the reader, who then writes back telling us that we're biased. <laughs> except, except more of them can write back telling us that we're biased faster than ever before because they don't have to deal with the uh, post office and stamps and all that. So all we've done is we've just done it faster. Not necessarily better, but faster. And now, let's talk about bias in journalism very briefly. I'm going to give you my definition of an unbiased journalist. Does anybody else have one first? What's an unbiased journalist? What is it? A, liar. a what? A liar. Mm, not necessarily. Anybody else? That's a good one. Right, so, but I'll give you mine. That I derived after listening to the Rush Limbaugh Show. An unbiased journalist is one who agrees with me in every way. <laughs> That's it. That is, that is an original statement. It will get into quote books. Write it down now. Because that is an unbiased journalist. Now you know how to be one, is agree with your audience. So here we are. And here I am, and my group of nutsy co-workers, another aside. At one point, we considered giving sanity tests to all pers prospective hires <laughs> and only hiring the ones who flunked. <laughs> and um, we've pretty much done that. It, it just wouldn't get, we just haven't quantified it. But, you know, we, we are all loons and use, useless in normal society. and We have obsessive compulsive complexes. And, we have people who rock and stuff, you know. You don't want to know these people. I wouldn't let them in my home, even though I am one. Well, my wife lets me in. I don't know. She, but she works for us, too, now, so I don't know. It's, and we do tend to suck people in and not let them out. So here we are, doing pretty much the same old stuff. We get information, and we summarize it, or we maybe add some of our own thoughts to it, and we put it through the magic door where it goes out to the world, and the world comes back to us telling us we're biased. Except that, like I said, it happens. We don't have as much machinery. You know, as far as big, giant industrial stuff, we're post-industrial, so we do it. And you guys supply your own printing presses, a.k.a. computers. Thank you so much. So we don't have to send paper copies. See how much cheaper it is? You guys all bought your own little printing presses. Isn't that nice of you? You did it for all those catalog merchants, too. Don't you think they love you? They don't have to send you a catalog, man. They just give you, you know, 12 letters you type into your catalog maker. There it is. L.L. Bean thinks you're wonderful if you have a computer. How many people in this room have computers? Com required. In other words, everybody for all practical purposes. Who doesn't? Come on, who's the one holdout? Well, I guess they are in another building. No, they didn't come here. You're right. Okay, so here we are with Slashdot, and we're doing that, and we're putting out these biased reports, and we're getting told, and people are sending us back the stuff quickly. Why do they send us more stuff than anybody else? Why do we have the biggest discussion board on the entire Internet, which I believe we do? Because you'll actually publish it. Yeah, I can go on New York Times or a, on the well, and, and it'll go. Why do you think? But what, why, why the, there's lots of other discussion boards online where they don't have to do that. Why are ours more popular? Why are they the best known? You ever heard of the Washington Post? Is it better known than Slashdot? Trust me, it is. I, I know Doug who runs WashingtonPost.com. I have friends who work at the Post. They assure me that they're better known. How about the Wall Street Journal? I know guys who work there. Well, you've got to pay money to get on their boards. Well, that's a point. I won't even do it. They asked me once to, to like, evaluate a story. I said, I don't have a subscription. Why do you give me? Oh, no, you'll have to. <laughs> but, but seriously, there's lots and lots of discussion boards out there. Why are Slashdot so popular? I, I was posting on the New York Times ones and, and, and indulging in absolutely wonderful, literate conversations with extremely intelligent people, many of them experts in their fields, 
before there was a slash dot. But why is slash dot so popular? No. We'll get to karma in a moment for those of you who don't know what that mistake is. <laughs> um, but the thing is, slash dot was started not in a medium capital and not by a journalismist or any of that, but by a computer science student who'd gotten beaten up for being a nerd a lot in a town called Holland, Michigan. And if you guys know, you, know, you guys know any Uper jokes? What? Right? A Uper is somebody from the Uper Peninsula of Michigan, and it's like being an Aggie in Texas. Everybody has a group. They despise it. They make bad jokes about it. In Michigan, it's Upers. You've got to learn your, your region stuff. Get out there and study. Journalism ain't nothing. No, not a construction. You've got to have material. I said I spent a lot of time just learning useless stuff, so I know what a Uper is. Okay? So they're kind of in Uper territory. I went to Holland, Michigan. I'm, 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 it sounds like I'm knocking these people, but... I drive into this town, I call one of our guys, Potter, a.k.a. Cowboy Neil, to you. And um, I say, hey, I'll be there in about five. Want me? I'm going to stop at the convenience store. You guys want anything? Cigarettes, soda, whatever. You see, I'll give me a pack of Marlboros. Anybody else around? They say, oh, yeah, I can hear somebody else in the room say, well, the IQ here just went up in the town measurably. Okay, we're not saying people in Holland are dumb, but it is one of those small, just manufacturing. Most people who do get anything on a ball do go to college and leave. They do. You know, there's a lot of towns in North Carolina like that. There's towns in Maryland. It is really the tragedy of America that may be returning. But anyway, it's not a terribly sophisticated area. And the guys who hung together here were an isolated little group. And Rob Malda, who was the leader of this band, or the best web designer really at the time, in college started a little site called Chips and Dips, and he just like write some sort of little observation about stuff every day. And then he got this, he started getting interested in Linux and Unix, and he came up with this recursive name, slash dot dot. Now that's obviously stupid, it's an internal joke. Slash dot dot org. Of course, it's backwards because it should be dot slash, right? So it was a joke. And he'd write this little observation, and, and, and people would, there's a little place where you could, like, talk back at Rob. And the thing is, Rob couldn't spell worth a damn. He's better now. He actually wrote something this morning that every word was spelled right. His friend in childhood, Jeff Bates, can spell, and always could, if he goes slow, but he's very hyper, he, he, he's, he's, he's like the, the king of typos. <laughs> and um, they were trying to go for speed, and they were doing this between classes at the time. So Rob would post something that, was, that had like a, a coherent thought, and they started to light on Linux, and that was just starting to get interesting to people, some people, maybe me, smarter people, you know, around, except for me, the dumb one. But smart people and me started using Linux, and we all drummed dumped windows, of course. And um, then people started responding to Rob. And why they respond to Rob, where they wouldn't respond to the New York Times, is in the New York Times, you really had to spell everything just right. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, you write a letter to the editor of the New York Times, you're going you're gonna, to like reread it. Am I right? Yeah, you, you might even proofread it. I wouldn't, but they've published letters from me because I don't proofread my own work anymore. I just do it right the first time. And easier. I told you, I got in this for money. You got to learn to go fast. And anyways, but, you know, if you were going to just respond to Rob Malda in Holland, Michigan, who says, I ain't no English guy, you don't spend a lot of time worrying about capitalization. In fact, Rob Malda, maybe, maybe a lot of people in Internet Relay Chat, for those of you who use such things, don't capitalize anything at, at times. I go through whole days where I don't capitalize anything because I just don't feel like it in IRC. I just, yeah, yeah, you know, it's just the, the inner comings comes out, you know. But you see, slash dot in casuals became casual. It's casual conversation. Now, who the heck read slash dot back then? People interested in Linux. Well, there, there's one. This is the kind of person who was an early slash dot reader. Note. The, um, the societally accepted demeanor, the suit. Hold the, on, I've got it over here. Got a sport coat. 
Okay, he's got a smirk. Upper class. You're upper class. So. <laughs> but you didn't have that coat then. No, if, I, if it's the coat that I had then, I would have been a slash star leader. <laughs> but you see, he, um, this is the kind of person, he was involved in all this iBiblio, you know, really leading edge web use stuff. And um, has told me it several times that he's somewhat dyslexic. And you see, a lot of programmers are dyslexic. And yet they felt comfortable in the slash dot little kind of cult-like feel, a little club, of talking to their friends. It was a small group. And it was okay to screw up your English or that leave an, a, a, a sent what I just did. See? <laughs> and it sounded kind of dumb, didn't it? But see, on Slashdot, you could get away with that. And there was another secret about Slashdot then and today. How many people take Slashdot seriously? I want you to think. This is a site whose very name is a joke that has the from the blank department, and every one of those is a joke that is posted with fake, you know, weird names started out, although we've gone to newer guys that use real names. How seriously do you take that? We don't take it at all seriously. We don't take ourselves seriously. We don't think we're the kings of the world. Um, or anything like that. We, we've all been incredibly lucky in some ways. But man, uh, Rob Malda was boxing uh, groceries at the supermarket before he figured out this internet stuff. And, you know, he didn't mind the job. He could go back to it. I like driving cabs. Um, we, we all have things we can do. You see, we're, we're just saying, okay, this is fun. We've had some adventures. It's been doing real well. We try to spell a people's names right. That's important. I do recommend that for any kind of journalism. You try to get the dates right, the numbers. I keep saying that, numbers. That's, we won't even get into journalistic deficiencies on numbers, or I'll, I'll go off into a tirade about major newspapers and why they, we should maybe license reporters. But I won't. So instead, I'm going to ask you, if you ran slash dot, what would you do better? How many of you have read Slash Dot? So the smart people are all over here, or are you just not admitting it? Which is it? <laughs> That's a question I can't answer. But I, I, just ask me any question. I don't care what it's about. I, I'll answer it. I'll answer any question you have. Mm. Yeah, me too. Well, that's because we love you and because the editors are corrupt. No, not really. I don't even know what you post under on. I've forgotten. I don't know. The reality is, is, is the, just as Slashdot grew, the system of reader moderation, so people could rate each other's posts, grew apace. And um, if you're, a lot of your posts that you did on the board were rated highly by other readers, you accumulated karma. Karma was a stupid name because people have attached more importance to it than they should, and the accumulation of karma became a whole separate game. <sighs> RTFM, just go read the site. It's all on there. Really, it is. Just go, go read the site. I, I, I'll explain that. Yeah. Right, Adam, man. Meta moderation is moderating the monitors. Mon mo moderating the monitors. And what that is, is what if somebody went on a vendetta and moderated everything that was like, for instance, 
started moderating things rather than for cogency or being on topic because of opinions, um, which is not really a valid reason to say that somebody else's writing is bad, you know, except for the biased journalist. But so you have to have somebody to moderate the quality of the moderators, and that's what meta moderation is. Did they do it fairly? If they called this you bleeping bleep, did they call did somebody moderate that as flame bait? Well that's correct. It is flame bait or a troll or off topic. It is one of those things. But if somebody moderated you bleeping bleep, you know bleeping bleep, moderated that informative, let's call that an unfair moderation, okay? Because it's not informative. That's what meta moderation is. And it's worked out fairly well. But now I'm going to go back to the question Paul originally asked. Remember that? This is a brick joke for the Kimmer fans here. I'll explain that privately later if you want to know. Why we make money and others don't. And why ZDNet doesn't do it well. Why Salon? Start small, I said, and grow. ZDNet, ZD was already a big magazine publisher. They jumped onto the net knowing that they were going to own the tech news market. And let's even go back before them. Let's take a small company called Time Life. Has anybody heard of them? Time Life. Time Warner, later known as, now called America Online, no longer Quantum. Now, Time Life owned magazines, paper magazines for many interests. They had one for sportsists called Sports Illustrated. They had one for people called People, actually for celebrity watchers. I'm sure they're very big on Princess Margaret dying this week as their story lead for the next month. They had one called Time for, I guess, wa people who own watches. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I used to write humor, okay? Humor is fun. I said not taking ourselves seriously. If you take yourself too seriously, there's no point, no matter what kind of work you do. The only people who take themselves seriously work at drive-in windows in fast food places. And it's not even the brightest of those. But anyway, they had, you know, you notice they had all these different magazines, each of which had its own title and its own brand. Branding, we use that now. I hate that word, but if I ever want to go into marketing and get really, really rich doing marketing, I have to use it, right? Branding. But they each had an identity in their own readers. And they had a whole bunch of magazines. Well, having learned this lesson and that that was how to run a magazine business and having done it very successfully for like 50 or 60 years, what they decided to do with the internet was create one giant website in which all the brands would be subsumed and they would call it Pathfinder. That would be the overall one giant brand. And it would be the one website, the only website you would ever need. You would just ever bookmark that URL, pathfinder.com and net. They couldn't get org. People still cared back then about the differentiations. And you would just go to that for all your news and information and, yes, discussion needs. And they hired a large number of people to write for this, both full-time for those who would not work for them full-time or had no intention of ever living in New York, they hired them freelance, including me. <laughs> hired everybody. You guys read Wired? You guys read Wired? You know Declan McCullough, who's the inflammatory, you know, crypto libertarian? Well, his editors do pull him back a little bit. Um, the ultra-libertarian um, Declan McCullough who actually was satirized in the only piece of libertarian soft porn ever written on the internet. I wrote that. I did not use my name. <laughs> but I would say a clever person who wanted to find it could find it. I'm going to give you several hints. Be good with anagrams. Know the geography of Washington, D.C. Anagrams, Washington, D.C. These are important. I see somebody with a wireless connection who gets the idea, and he looks like he knows this stuff. But Declan and I were two of the more inflammatory writers on their Netly news side, which was supposed to be like all hip and stuff, you know. And, and we were really tied in with the guys who did Feed and Suck. Has anybody ever heard of these? these? 
Well, you see, you guys are like intellectuals and stuff. Um, Carl Stedman. Does anybody remember Carl Stedman? Really? So, I, I, in a way, I'm glad. Does anybody remember his Walter Miller satires, Life in Hell? Well, thank God not many people do anymore. <laughs> That's a, that was an in-joke. And now you know about the name Walter and where it came. And I lived in a house trailer and still do. And it's very complex interaction here because there were only about 200 people at the time getting actually paid every day to write on the Internet. Very small number. I don't know how many are now, but it's, it's in the many thousands. We, we, we got a nice achievable number, and then we had the dumb stuff, and now we're back to an achievable number. But let's go back to Pathfinder, who showed us the way not to do it to begin with. Now, first of all, God does not have, and I'm not trying to step on any religious toes, but God does not have a budget. So they had more money than God, because God does not need money, right? Maybe churches and earthly manifestations and such need money, but God does. So they had more money than God, and they had more money than most churches because they were time life. And in the process here, they became time warner. These people had a lot of money, and they were going to dominate the Internet. They were going to own it. They were going to produce news of sports and of people and of watches and times and entertainment and uh, you know, all of this stuff. And the Netly News was their... Um, Internet only ultra hip people, you know, for tech hipsters. You know. That's where they hired me. Little did they know I did flummox some good, didn't I? And the thing is, they were going to be cool. How many people here go to Pathfinder? Well, that's because they killed it. How many people ever use Pathfinder? Yeah, hardly. And the redesigns. That's a whole separate comment. This commentation on why Razorfish was always evil. They were the most famous web design house in the world. They were evil. And their designs were very bad and hard to use, slow to load, and hard to work with on the back end. And the next thing on, you know, I'll go into another tirade about Story Server, the back end content management system they all used. And I hate it. But anyway, they failed. This is the world's largest magazine publisher tried to dominate the Internet by doing this subsume into one giant brand name, and they failed miserably and expensively. Now, can the rest of us in this room, how many people in this room have a personal net worth of over $100 million? Do I hear $50 million? Do I hear $10 million? Come on, fess up. We don't want your money. We all got our own money. Now, I, I was an internet paper millionaire, you know, for a, a two weeks once. Really, I was. My wife and I calculated our net worth, including the stock we couldn't sell yet, and we were worth $1.2 million on paper uh, before taxes. <laughs> I will tell you, we got, in the end, we actually did come away with about half of that before taxes. Let me see. Pay off the house. You insure college education for five children, second marriages for both, and one's in a junior college, and, you know, still paying on him. But you do all of that, and you help all your family and friends, and especially after you pay a whole congressman's salary in the state of Maryland, you pay enough for a state representative, and you buy some expensive munitions. I saw my tax bill. You know how much money you got left? And you buy a sailboat and some other stuff, small sailboat. You buy some other toys for yourself. You know how much you got left? No. Come on, we're not that stupid. About 75000 But... What I got, an approximate liquid assets, plus, you know, some minor real estate. So that's what I personally got out of the dot-com boom. I ain't complaining. I'm real happy. A lot of people didn't get anything. You know what? I still have options. I haven't cashed in, some of which are actually worth probably, I think, net total $8,000. A far cry. <laughs> yeah. Anybody ever heard of VA software, with VA Linux? They're our parent company, the largest rise in history. And the, but wait. I'm a depressed member. I'm a professional editor, which means I'm a depressed person and I have to look for the downside, right? Right, I do, you know. So, so wouldn't you say that VA probably also had the largest fall in history? <sighs> 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 I 
Uh, let's not go there. I can go into a, I'm going to tell you another thing, a, a digression here before we go back to it, about reporting. And I said this to a much smaller group in Paul's class earlier. Follow the money. I've heard that. You've heard it. It's true. Do follow the money. Follow financial records. If you're going to be a serious reporter, if you're going to do civic stuff or business stuff, or you're going to report about anything else, and even if you want to just learn stuff or have your own financial health and not get screwed too badly, learn to read numbers and follow the money. Learn how to read 10Ks and 10Qs and all those SEC reports. Public companies have to put the information out. The inconsistencies in Enron's reports and in others have not been unobvious. A person with no training, and I'm telling you as somebody who dropped out of high school, went back and did manage to con Canyon Del Oro High School outside of Tucson, Arizona, into coughing up an actual diploma. Really, they did. Although I didn't stay for the graduation ceremony, I went right back to California and the beach. But they did. I didn't like school, so I didn't go to college. Why well, do more of something you don't like? Different people, different tastes. You guys like it. It's okay. My wife does too. She's a perennial student. But the, um, the thing is, I have no education in that field. To me, economics is a hobby. I just enjoy reading about it. I enjoy business as humor. I cannot interview a corporate executive with a straight face. They all say the same stuff anyway after a while. I can just write their answers. Wait, but um, you can all, everybody in this room has a capacity to learn to read those items and to understand them. If you are a reporter, you can always make better stories by doing that as part of the underpinning. And it's very easy. Y'all got the internet. I do too so lucky. But when we didn't, I still did it. It's just real easy nowadays. Back in the old days, the information, you had to go find it, and it was like work and stuff. Now it's just click. So there's no work, you know. Hoover's, you know, and that sort of thing. SEC.gov. There's no excuse for not having all that information. It is at your fingertips. You all know and those of you who are doing the journalism thing especially, you're all familiar with um, Drudge, right? You're familiar with Drudge. You know that Drudge runs the world's greatest site. Now, Colin Powell and I both think that Drudge's site is the best site in the world. And you guys think I'm talking about Matt Drudge, and I am not. I am talking about his father, Robert Drudge, who runs RefDesk. Write this down if you're a note taker. R-E-F-D-E-S-K dot com. If you are a student, a teacher, or a journalist, and you are not aware of this site, please make yourself aware of it. It's the world's greatest site. You know it, don't you? Yeah, see, some of us know. See, so you can tell the people, the people in the, in the good-looking clothes and the people who don't have to wear good-looking clothes both use it. And Colin Powell has said publicly more than once that that is his favorite website. It is the key reference thing. And you can get to all of that through there. And now let's go back to the corporate stuff and how they make money and how they don't. We've proved that we can't be all things to all people and make money because Pathfinder failed. So far, how many years, at last estimate, would it take if Amazon.com sold every book sold in the United States of America and got a 15% margin on their products? What was the last estimate and how long it would take them to pay off all corporate debt and achieve a 10% return on investment for their present, for their stockholders at current, more or less current stock prices. How long would it take? The last I heard, it was an infinite number of years. It was not doable. But you ought to go check that out. You see, see I just said return on investment. I said, They've tried to be all things at all people. Now, interestingly enough, the original Amazon book, who can tell me what city the original Amazon book was located? Where, where was it? Still is. St. Paul, Minnesota. The original Amazon bookstore was a lesbian-owned women's book collective, and they had a domain name dispute with uh, the guys in Seattle. And uh, the Amazon Collective got a substantial settlement. They are in business. They are consistently profitable. 
They've always been consistently profitable, and they are very small. Nobody's getting rich, but they all make an okay living. Isn't that fun? Which would you rather invest in? The Amazon that's run by five women who make money, or the Amazon run by Jeff Bezos that has made money once, one quarter, possibly by doing a lot of accounting tricks that may not be repeatable, and probably aren't. Which one is a better business? Now let's go with the ladies in, in St. Paul, right? I sure would. Now, so far we've seen that Amazon can't do it. Pathfinder couldn't do it. ZDNet. ZDNet tries to, has been trying to be all tech things as far as news. Oh, I know, Linux is hot. Let's hire some people and go do Linux news. Um, Java. Yeah, let's go do Java. Let's do this over here. Let's do this over here. And they run all over the darn place. And, and uh, what does ZDNet do? Who can tell me now? I don't know. What, wait a minute. Once again, you had this company that had these really good magazines, each with its own identity and readership. What did they do? Pathfinder thing, right? Same thing. One big site. CNET has been smarter. News.com is a general interest tech news thing. It works. Download.com, downloadable software, and so on and so forth. Buy stuff over here. Buy stuff. And, and um, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but anybody look at ever count the number of, let's call them sponsorship or promotional opportunities on CNET's main page? It averages 14. How many people in this room count banner ads and text links on ad-supported websites and estimate their value? Mm. I do that a lot, but I have to. It's part of my job. This goes back to the original secret of how to make money online, therefore taking in more than you spent. You can cost out what it costs to run a website. Then you have to go to the other side and decide, how much can we take in? I don't know. How much is a banner ad worth? Who can tell me? Yeah. Does. Who can tell me what a quarter page newspaper ad is worth? Yeah. Yes, it does. How much is a 30 second television spot worth? Huh? Yeah, tell me how much a Super Bowl spot is worth. Yeah. Right. How much does that workout cost per thousand? How many people have worked out at even even roughly the cost per thousand for a 30 second spot on the Super Bowl? Comparatively. How much is a banner worth? Well, it depends on the site and who you are, yeah. How many you are? I'm going to talk in cost per thousand because that is the unit that advertisers buy with. And that's the language you have to speak when you go to the <laughs> wonderful advertising. And we speak to the hypothetically, and we're denigrating here, Muffy Media Buyer, who doesn't know anything. And she did not come to these classes. And she is not fit to sit in the same class as you. But Daddy's rich, so she is in New York and is subsidized. And she can get one of those internships at an ad agency where media buyers come from. I've been to parties and met many. I'm not kidding. I'm sure there are some smart ones, you know, like Burdick and so, uh, people in Chicago and such. Maybe some of the locals, but New York, I'm not impressed. But what they look at is cost per thousand versus targeting. That's valid. What's worth to whom? OK, look at our sites. I can tell you who reads our sites in great detail. Our core audience is software developers. And network administrators, here, you guys are hardcore slash dot readers. Am I looking at hardcore slash dot readers? Yeah, okay. occasional. Depends on the day. How many times a day? All right, three or four. See, <laughs> that's what we mean by an occasional. <laughs> like it's just a cult, man. It's a cult. We've got these guys. You? Yeah, there's another one. <laughs> what do you do for a living? I'm a Java programmer. It's a Java programmer. Okay, and you do? That's a good ad. So, in other words, he's an owner. One of the he didn't put his hand up when I said ten million net worth. You look like one. Network administrator. See, look at these guys. These guys have what we call purchase order power, or the ability to demand stuff. They can go to bosses and say, 
we need a new X21A45 running literally to do this, and it's only $75,000, and it's going to save us in man hours approximately $140,000 in increased network reliability by 18.4%. Now, bosses who have no idea what they just said say, oh, uh, when do you need it by, or words to that effect. So if you're selling these things, and you want to sell stuff to Java programs, how many people in this room um, know what a net bean is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, see, see. Now, Sun Microcomputing advertises a lot of Java stuff on our sites. They advertise there because these guys read those sites. 